and others. Mr. Moyane was motivated wholly or in part by or he sought to advance the objectives of state capture or he was abusing a legal process for his own personal goals that had either nothing or little to do with a legitimate complaint relating to an alleged crime. Two, to the extent that 1A above may not correctly reflect what Mr. Godin meant, he must succinctly state what he meant when he stated that Mr. Moyane had acted maliciously in laying the charges against him and others. Mr. Godin's clarificatory affidavit. In due course, Mr. Godin delivered a clarificatory affidavit. In that affidavit, he, among other things, said, A, he had never said that Mr. Moyane had acted maliciously when he laid charges against him. B, it was Mr. Moyane who had said in his affidavit that Mr. Gordon had implied that he had acted maliciously in laying the crim criminal complaint against him. C, he did not know Mr. Moyane's state of mind when Mr. Moyane laid the criminal complaint against him. D, Mr. Moyane's motive in laying the charges against him was irrelevant. E, he disagreed with Mr. Moyane's explanation that in laying the criminal complaint against him, Mr. Moyane had acted as any reasonable commissioner of SARS in his position would have acted. F, he personally believed that Mr. Moyane, I'm sorry, I'm he personally believed that, quote, Mr. Moyane did abuse legal processes for reasons already explained in, close quotes, in my evidence, close quotes. G, his belief that Mr. Moyane had abused legal processes was, and I quote, based on my experience of his defiant attitude and vilification of me following my reappointment as Minister of Finance, which was aimed at forcing me to resign from that position so that the capture of National Treasury could proceed under a different minister, close quotes. H, open quotes, to use the words of the chairperson's directions, I therefore do mean that Mr. Moyane, quote, was motivated wholly or in part by, or he sought to advance the objectives of state capture, close single quotes, and that, open single quotes, he was abusing a legal process for his own personal goals that had either nothing or little to do with a legitimate complaint relating to an alleged crime, close double quotes. This statement by Mr. Gordon appears to be linked to that part of the directions which required him to say whether he meant that in laying the charges against him, Mr. Moyane, open double quotes, was motivated wholly or in part by or he sought to advance the objectives of state capture, close double quotes. I, quotes, he believes, that is Mr. Gordon, that Mr. Moyane's personal goals while he was SARS commissioner included the advancement of the state capture project, close double quotes. J, his belief that Mr. Moyane's personal goals in single quotes while he
he was Commissioner of SARS, open double quotes, included the advancement of the state capture project, close double quotes, is founded on what, open double quotes, is founded on what we all now know about how, single quotes, the failure of integrity and governance at SARS, soundly evidenced by the change over four years, has certainly compromised the performance of its core function of collecting tax to the detriment of the country at large, closing the quotes, as found by Justice Nugent in the Commission of Inquiry into Tax Administration and Governance by SARS. In brackets, the Nugent Inquiry, page 477, paragraph 19 of the final report of the Nugent Inquiry, close quotes and close double quotes. Did Mr. Gordon ever allege Mal de Moyane's part? Paragraph 5. The directions of 6 May 2019 were issued on the basis that Mr. Gordon had alleged in his statement of 11 October 2018 to this commission that Mr. Moyane had acted maliciously in laying the charges that he had laid against him. In his clarificatory affidavit, Mr. Gordon says he never made such an allegation. Here is why it was stated in the directions that Mr. Gordon had alleged that Mr. Moyane had acted maliciously in laying the charges that he had laid against him. A. In the sentence, in the last sentence of paragraph 104 of Mr. Gordon's statement of 11 October 2018, Mr. Gordon said, and I quote, charges against me relating to that unit had been filed by Mr. Moyane on 15 May 2015, in brackets SAPS Brooklyn case number 427, stroke 05, stroke 15, close brackets and close quotes. B, in paragraph 113 of the same statement, Mr. Gordon states, and I quote, this set of events combined with what is set out below was the beginning of what appeared to be a campaign to force me to resign as Minister of Finance and continue the efforts to capture the National Treasury thereafter, close quotes. The set of events referred to at the beginning of paragraph 113 seems to include the event of filing of the filing of the charges by Mr. Moyane against Mr. Gordon mentioned in paragraph 104 of Mr. Gordon's statement. C. In paragraph 130 of his October 8, 2018 statement, Mr. Gordon said that open quotes, double quotes, the orchestrated campaign against me and other leaders of National Treasury raged within cabinet, the institutions of state, and on certain media and social media platforms, close double quotes. He then says that that campaign, open double quotes, shifted to yet another front later in the year when I became the target of malicious and seemingly politically motivated criminal charges, close double quotes. The charges which Mr. Gordon describes in this quotation as double quotes, malicious and politically motivated criminal charges, close double quotes, are the charges, in quotes, that he says in paragraph 104 of his statement were filed by Mr. Moyane against him. I think it is what Mr. Gordon says in paragraphs 104, 113, and 130 of his statement, 
and possibly elsewhere as well that suggests that Mr. Gordon meant that Mr. Moyane had acted maliciously in laying the charges against him. Mr. Moyane says in his affidavit in the application for leave to cross-examine Mr. Gordon that Mr. Gordon implied such allegation in his statement. Counsel for Mr. Moyane submits that whether Mr. Gordon made the allegation expressly or by implication is neither here nor there, as what is important is that it was made. Paragraph 7. Bearing in mind that earlier in his statement, Mr. Gordon had talked of Mr. Moyane having laid charges against him, it would have been difficult to think that when Mr. Gordon said he became the target of malicious and seemingly politically motivated criminal charges, he did not also intend to mean that the person who laid those charges against him also acted maliciously in laying them. Mr. Gordon's reliance on the findings of Justice Nugent. Paragraph 8. Mr. Gordon also highlights certain findings by Justice Nugent, which he says form, and I quote, double quotes, the basis for my belief that Mr. Moyane's actions as SARS commissioner were part of the state capture project, close double quotes. Mr. Gordon then deals with these findings in paragraphs 23 to 33 of his affidavit, whereafter comes the last paragraph of the affidavit. Paragraph 9, Mr. Gordana refers to paragraphs 35 to 50 of Justice Nugent's interim report. He states that in those paragraphs, Justice Nugent set out, uh, double quotes, the extraordinary turmoil at SARS and for its senior management in particular that followed Mr. Moyane's appointment, closed double quotes. He then says in the following paragraph that, open uh, double quotes, this included the filing of his criminal complaint against me in circumstances that Justice Nugent found, <coughs> excuse me, open single quote, unclear, <coughs> and which were later withdrawn. This turmoil saw the removal of many senior SARS officials, creating the opportunity for Mr. Muyane to appoint senior management at SARS who failed to show the same integrity, skill, commitment, or commitment to its critical functions, close quotes. 10. Mr. Gordon goes on to state that in his statement to this commission dated 11 October 2018, specifically in paragraphs 104, 127, and 127.4, he opened double quotes, recorded numerous examples of the acrimonious nature of Mr. Moyane's rejection of my oversight while I was Minister of Finance, and his insulting attacks on me following my reappointment as Minister of Finance in December 2015, close quotes. Mr. Godan then says in the next paragraph, and I quote, double quotes, this provides the context to and the basis for my belief that Mr. Moyane's laying off a complaint against me was something other than the actions of a reasonable commissioner of SARS, close double quotes. The reference to this, in quotes, at the beginning of this passage includes what Mr. Gordon said in paragraph 26 of the clarificator affidavit. 11, Mr. Gordon then refers to a finding made by Justice Nugent and quoted the following passage from Justice Nugent's final report. Open double quotes. The effective functioning of SARS calls for close collaboration between SARS and other institutions. It is to be expected that the Commissioner of SARS will liaise closely with the Minister of Finance, but while Mr. Gordon held that position, there was active defiance. When Mr. Gordon became concerned at the steps being taken to change the operating model, he asked for it to be suspended, but that was ignored. 
When it is approved, the, the extent of bonuses to be paid, Mr. Moyane again defied him, bringing him into conflict with the Auditor General. According to Treasury officials, the relationship between Treasury and Mr. Moyane has all been broken down. Close double quotes. 12. Mr. Gordon also states, open double quotes, considering my interactions with Mr. Moyane over this period and the subsequent findings of the Nugent inquiry, my personal belief remains that Mr. Moyane abused his position as the former SARS commissioner to institute criminal proceedings against me and others under SAPS Brooklyn case number 427 stroke 05 stroke 15 since there was no reasonable basis for him to do so close double quotes 13 Mr. Godan goes on to state that he viewed Mr. Moyane's conduct open double quotes in filing the charges against me as yet another expression of the defiant attitude he exhibited towards me as found by Justice Nugent, close double quotes. I pause here to make the point that this allegedly defiant attitude by Mr. Moyane towards Mr. Gordon, of which Mr. Gordon says the laying of the criminal charge or complaint was another expression, is said by Mr. Gordon elsewhere in his clarificatory affidavit to have been part of a campaign aimed at putting pressure on him to resign as Minister of Finance so as to capture National Treasury under a different minister. Mr. Gordon added that Mr. Moyane's conduct in open double quotes, filing the charges, close double quotes, open double quotes against me, close double quotes, and open double quotes also served the political purpose of attempting to pressure me and others to resign, thereby advancing state capture and the capture of national treasury in particular, close double quotes. 14. The last paragraph in Mr. Gordon's clarificator after which is to the effect that Mr. Gordon stands by his contention that his cross examination by Mr. Moyane's legal representatives regarding Mr. Moyane's, in quotes, personal goals, personal motive for filing the complaint that led to criminal charges being brought against me and my personal belief that those charges were part of the campaign to force my resignation from the position of Minister of Finance so as to facilitate the capture of National Treasury is unlikely to assist the important and urgent work of the Commission given its time and resource constraints. Close double quotes. 15. Mr. Gordon also states that his statement that Mr. Moyane abused legal processes when he laid a complaint against him is based on his experience of Mr. Moyane's, in brackets, defiant attitude and vilification of me following my reappointment as Minister of Finance, close double quotes. Mr. Gordon states, then states that he believes that Mr. Moyane's, open double quotes, defiant attitude, close double quotes, and vilification, open double quotes, were aimed at forcing or pressuring me to resign from that position so that the capture of National Treasury could proceed under a different minister, close quotes. Mr. Moyane's response to the clarificator affidavit. Mr. Paragraph 16, Mr. Moyane did not deliver an affidavit in response to Mr. Gordon's clarificator affidavit. He delivered written submissions this was not inconsistent with the directions issued on 6 May 2019. In the written submissions, counsel for Mr. Moyane pointed out that the reason why Mr. Moyane did not deliver an affidavit was that, uh, double quotes, Mr. Gordon's affidavit actually confirms the allegations of malice on the part of Mr. Moyane, close quotes. In support of this, counsel for Mr. Moyane referred to, among others, Mr. Gordon's statements quoted in 3B and Roman and I above. Mr. Moyane's counsel submitted that Mr. Moyane had already said that in laying the criminal complaint against Mr. Gordon, he did not act maliciously, but acted in good faith and reasonably. 
at the merits. 17. While Mr. Gordon states he never alleged that Mr. Moyane acted malicious in laying the criminal complaint he laid against him, he states that as such commissioner, Mr. Moyane had adopted a defiant attitude towards him and had vilified him with the aim of forcing or pressuring him into resigning as Minister of Finance so that the capture of National Treasury could proceed under a different minister. Mr. Gordon also states that Mr. Moyane, open double quotes, was motivated wholly or in part by or he sought to advance the objects of state capture. Thereafter, he states that he believes that while Mr. Moyane was SAS commissioner, his personal goals included the advancement of the state capture project. 18. There can be no doubt that if Mr. Moyane's defined attitude towards and vilification of Mr. Gordon were aimed at forcing or pressuring the latter into resigning as Minister of Finance so that the capture of the National Treasury could proceed under a different Minister of Finance, it would, generally speaking, be in the interest of the work of the Commission to grant Mr. Moyane leave to cross-examine Mr. Gordon. Equally, there can be no doubt that if in laying the criminal complaint against Mr. Gordon, Mr. Moyane was, and I open double quotes, motivated wholly or in part by or he sought to advance the objectives of state capture, it would, generally speaking, be in the interest of the work of this commission that I grant Mr. Moyane leave to cross-examine Mr. Gordon. 19. Mr. Gordon did not in his statement of 11 October 2018 expressly say that he believed that in adopting the defiant attitude that he says Mr. Moyane adopted towards him after his reappointment as Minister of Finance and in vilifying him as he says Mr. Moyane did, Mr. Moyane sought to force him or to put pressure on him to resign from his position as Minister of Finance so that the capture of National Treasury could, pro pro could proceed and a different minister. Nor did Mr. Gordon say in that statement that his position is that in laying the complaint against him, Mr. Moyane was motivated wholly or in part by or he sought to advance the objectives of state capture. 20. Mr. Gordon also did not say in that statement that Mr. Moyane's personal goals while he was SARS commissioner included the advancement of the state capture project. However, Mr. Gordon seems to explain this when he says in his qualificatory affidavit that relevant findings made by Justice Nugent form the basis, or certain relevant findings made by Justice Nugent form the basis of his belief that Mr. Moyane's personal goals while he was SARS commissioner included the advancement of the state capture project. It would seem that since those findings had not been made as yet when Mr. Gordon made his statement in October 2018, Mr. Gordon could not have formed that belief at the time. Hence the absence of such allegations in that statement. Mr. Gordon's belief seems to be a belief that he formed after Justice Nugent had made uh, the findings to which Mr. Gordon refers in his clarificatory affidavit. 21. In the directions I issued on 6 May 2019, it was stated that the directions were not intended to invite Mr. Gordon or Mr. Moyane to furnish new facts which were not contained in their respective affidavits that had already been delivered to the Commission, but that only clarification was sought. Those directions were also to the effect that should Mr. Moyane wish to comment on Mr. Gordon's clarificator affidavit, he must deliver to the acting secretary of the Commission and serve on Mr. Gordon a short affidavit on or before 21 May 2019, close quotes. As already indicated above, Mr. Moyane elected not to comment by way of an affidavit on Mr. Cla on Mr. Gordon's clarificator affidavit. The result is that Mr. Moyane has not responded by way of an affidavit or aff affirmed declaration to Mr. Gordon's clarificator affidavit to the effect that he does mean that Mr. Moyane was motivated in whole or in part by or he sought to advance the objective of state capture. 
or that Mr. Gordon believes in the light of certain findings made by Justin Nugent in his reports that Mr. Moyane's personal goals while he was SARS commissioner included the advancement of the state capture project. Indeed, he has not therefore given his version to this uh, evidence. 23. Ordinarily, I would not grant an applicant leave to cross-examine a witness if he has not given his version to the allegations or ev evidence implicating him. Indeed, this is what happened when I considered Mr. Moyane's application for leave to cross-examine Mr. Gordon in respect of other issues. However, this time Mr. Moyane previously did not consider it necessary to deliver an affidavit to deal with the allegations or evidence in Mr. Gordon's clarificator affidavit. The directions I had issued did not oblige him to do so. 24. The day before the hearing of argument on whether I should grant Mr. Moyane leave to cross-examine Mr. Gordon on the outstanding issue, I caused a letter to be sent to Mrs. Gordon's and Moyane's legal representatives in which I indicated that my prima facie view was that I should grant Mr. Moyane leave to cross-examine Mr. Gordon, but that should I grant such leave, it could be necessary that I direct Mr. Moyane to deliver an affidavit or a firm declaration in which he would set out his version. In response to the letter, Mr. Moyane's legal representatives finished the commission with a letter which was to the effect that Mr. Moyane's primary contention was that I should grant him leave to cross-examine Mr. Gordon without any precondition. The letter was also to the effect that the other options were for me to either grant Mr. Moyane leave to cross-examine Mr. Gordon, but direct him to provide his version first as a precondition, or direct Mr. Moyane to first deliver his affidavit or affirm de declaration, setting out his version, and only grant him leave to cross-examine Mr. Gordon thereafter. Mr. Moyane's counsel confirmed this position during the hearing of argument. If I grant Mr. Moyane leave to cross-examine Mr. Gordon, I will have to direct him to give his version. 25. On behalf of Mr. Moyane, it was submitted that the prima facie view I had expressed with regard to granting Mr. Moyane leave to cross-examine Mr. Gordon was justified and correct and that I should grant Mr. Moyane's application. On behalf of Mr. Gordon, it was submitted that I should dismiss Mr. Moyane's application because Mr. Gordon had never said that in laying the complaint that Mr. Moyane laid against Mr. Gordon, he had acted maliciously. The difficulty that arises from this submission on behalf of Mr. Gordon is that although Mr. Gordon does not or does say that he never alleged that Mr. Moyane acted maliciously in laying the complaint he laid against him, he says elsewhere in his clarificatory affidavit that the laying of the complaint by Mr. Moyane had little or nothing to do with a legitimate complaint relating to an alleged crime. He also says that Mr. Moyane abused a legal process by laying the complaint that he laid against him. I also understand his evidence to be to the effect that in laying the criminal complaint that he laid against him, Mr. Moyane sought to advance the objects of state capture. 26. A question that may be asked is whether by requiring Mr. Moyane to give his version to this commission on the issues raised in Mr. Gordon's clarificator affidavit, this commission is not repeating the work that has already been done by the SARS Commission. This commission does not wish to repeat the work of the SARS Commission. However, two or three observations need to be made in this regard. The first is that the terms of reference of the SARS Commission did not include an investigation into allegations of state capture. Secondly, this Commission cannot make findings against Mr. Moyane or anyone for that matter. I'm going to repeat that. Secondly, this Commission cannot make findings that Mr. Moyane or anyone for that matter performed their duties in order to advance the state capture project or the objectives of state capture without giving such a person the opportunity to be heard. It is necessary for this commission to hear Mr. Moyane's version or side of the story, and if it is in the interest of the work of this commission that he be granted leave to cross as a Mr. Minister Gordon, grant him such leave. An allegation that someone performed his or her duties in order to advance 
the state capture project is a serious allegation and those facing such an allegation should be given an opportunity to defend themselves against it. So 27, I consider that subject to one condition, it is in the interest of the work of the commission to grant Mr. Moyane leave to cross-examine Mr. Gordon. Before this commission, it must rank as the most serious allegation or statement for it to be said that you performed your official duties in order to advance the objectives of state capture. And speaking generally, such a person should be granted a leave to cross-examine if it is in the interest of the work of this commission to do so. The condition is that Mr. Moyane will have to deliver an affidavit or affirmed declaration in response to Mr. Gordon's clarificator affidavit so as to give this commission his version on issues raised in Mr. Gordon's affidavit. I will therefore grant Mr. Moyane the required leave subject to that condition. In the result, the, my decision is the following. One, subject to two below, Mr. Moyane is hereby granted leave to cross as a Mr. Gordon on A, whether in laying the criminal complaint or charges against Mr. Gordon, Mr. Moyane acted maliciously, B, whether in laying the criminal complaint against Mr. Gordon, Mr. Moyane was motivated wholly or in part by, or he sought to advance the objectives of state capture. C, whether in laying the criminal complaint against Mr. Gordon, Mr. Moyane was abusing a legal process for his own personal goals that had nothing, to, nothing or little to do with a legitimate complaint relating to an alleged crime. D, whether, as Commissioner of SARS, Mr. Moyane sought to advance the state capture project. E, whether Mr. Moyane's personal goals while he was SARS Commissioner included the advancement of the state capture project. Two, Mr. Moyane is directed to deliver to the Acting Secretary or Secretary of the Commission on or before 15 January 2020 an affidavit or a firm declaration in which, in which he responds to the clarificatory affidavit delivered by Mr. Gordon. Three, Mr. Moyane's affidavit or firm declaration must make it clear which affirmance or allegations or statements in Mr. Gordon's affidavit he admits or denies what the basis are for denying or disputing those he denies or disputes and give Mr. Moyane's full version in regard to the allegations or comments. Four, the amount of time that will be granted to Mr. Moyane to cross-examine Mr. Uh, to Mr. Moyane's counsel to cross-examine Mr. Gordon will be determined at a later date. That is my decision. Director, thank you, Chair. Um, I think we'll take a short break and then resume to hear the evidence of today's witness. Yes, Chair. Um, Is that we in need order? to just put some more documents in your witness file. Uh, okay. relating to certain matters that will be raised by the first witness, if we may do so. Okay. So how much time do you think we should... Uh, 10, 15 minutes? 15 minutes. 15 please. minutes. Yes. Okay. Well, let's make it... Uh, it's about 13 minutes past 10. Let's make it uh, half past 10. Thank you, Chair. We are Jen. All rise.
Yes, Mr. Pretorius, are you ready? Thank you, Chair. The first witness uh, today is Mr. Riaz Sheikh, better known as Mo Sheikh. Uh, before he takes the affirmation, uh, may I just point out that on your desk or before, on your bench, Chair, is a new bundle, PP1 to PP4. PP1 contains the statement of Mr. Sheikh, and PP4 contains certain documents relevant to that statement. PP2 and PP3 are the statements of further witnesses to testify today and tomorrow. Uh, why is PP4 not part of PP1? Uh, PP4 is in that bundle, it's just been put in there. Yes, but you say those it, it consists of additional documents that relate to PP1. The PP1 is the it's statement of Mr. Sheikh. Yes. PP2 and PP3 are the statements of the further witnesses to testify today yes. and tomorrow. Yes. PP4 contains certain additional documents relevant to PP1 that have just been placed in the file. Well, why are they not made part of PP1? That's my they question. Could be. They could be. <laughs> because, but because they are only relevant to PP1. Yes, it's just an administrative uh, yeah. an issue that had to be dealt with because the documents were paginated. Yes. PP1 to PP3 were paginated. So when PP4 came along, uh, the pagination required them to be placed at the end. That's the reason. Is, is it possible to change that, or is that logistically? We can change it. It's not a problem, Chair. We can. Uh, it may just be, the page it may, numbering that, that it, is the It may be that since it's been done, it might be difficult. I'm just having a look uh, how, whether it would... Uh, See, Chair... All that would, would, would be needed is to change the page pagination. Maybe if the last page of... Mr. Sheikh's statement is, for example, page 20, then those other documents could come after page 20 and be marked 20A, 20B, 20 That could be done, and we yes, can do that, Jim. Yes, yes. Uh, the, the, there is a, one other qualification, and that the documents in PP4 are relevant to all the witnesses, because all the witnesses deal with the same subject matter, for these proceedings at least or they are not relevant only to Mr. Not Shakespeare, only. because that, that's what I understood you to say. Maybe, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, and they are not referred to in his statement? No. Okay, then maybe it's fine, we can leave them as they are. I think it's simply because you said, or you, I understood you to say they are, they belong to Mr. Shakespeare's statement, but if they are relevant for all the witnesses, then yes. they can stay as PP4. Uh, yes. Uh, Chair, just by way of clarification further, these statements were taken and recorded some time ago. Since then, um, uh, it was felt by the legal team that further matters should be dealt with of a general nature and of a specific nature. Because the subject matter relates to all three witnesses, the fourth section of the bundle would really logically apply to all of them. Okay, no, that's fine. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the file containing the statements of Mr. Riaz Sheikh, Mr. Njenge, and Mr. Makatuka will be admitted as Exhibit PP, and Mr. Sheikh's statement will be admitted as PP1, Mr. Janja's statement as PP2, Mr. Makatuka's statement as PP3, and certain additional documents at the end of uh, the bundle as PP4. Yes. Uh, 
Uh, may I just, by way of introduction, uh, refer to a few matters uh, relevant to the evidence of the witness. Um, the three witnesses to give evidence today and tomorrow uh, will deal with the activities of security officials. Uh, before we do that, um, uh, I don't know whether counsel on a watching brief would like to go on record or he's fine without going on record. Perhaps he should. I, I, yeah, okay. <laughs> let, let him place himself on record. Thank you very much, Chairperson. My name is Madi Michalamola. I'm here on a watch and brief on, on behalf of Dr. Sia Bonga Twele. Thank you. The former minister of... Uh, I get confused about uh, uh, security and intelligence. And minister of Intelligence. Yeah. yeah okay. All right. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. As I was saying, Chair, the witnesses who will testify today and tomorrow will deal with the activities of certain security officials uh, relevant to the terms of reference of the Commission. The first witness, as we've stated, is Mr. Sheikh. Yes. But in addition, by virtue of the knowledge and experience of Mr. Sheikh in the security intelligence field, he's able to assist the Commission firstly to understand the various constitutional structures uh, which deal with the intelligence function uh, dictated by the Constitution and the relationship between them. He's also able to assist the Commission to highlight and explain the relevant constitutional provisions, obviously not to interpret and apply them. Uh, that's clearly the function of the Court and to the extent that you need to do so, Chair, yourself but to explain generally the standards of conduct required by the Constitution of security entities and operatives uh, about which there will be substantive, substantial evidence in addition in 2020. And that will be the first part of Mr. Sheikh's evidence. Yes. Three, three notices have been issued. Um, the statements, I guess as I've a said, long time ago. Yes. Yes. Acceptably, Chair. Mm. Um, the three three notices have been issued. The statements, as you will have noted, are very brief, and it will be necessary to expand on them, but not in a way which detracts mm. from the procedural requirements. Mm. Okay. May the witness take the affirmation. Thank you. Please state your full names for the record. Riaz Sheikh. Do you have any objection with making the prescribed affirmation? No. Do you solemnly affirm that the evidence you will give shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? If so, please raise your right hand and say, I truly affirm. I truly affirm. Thank you very much, Mr. Sheikh. Before we proceed, I just want to say that uh, I appreciate the fact that you have made yourself available to come and uh, share what you know with the Commission. Um, as you probably know from last year, I have been calling for uh, former DGs and uh, current DGs, former DGs and senior officials in various government departments and um, in municipalities, senior officials to come forward if they know matters that fall within the terms of reference of the Commission. And uh, there have been times when I've expressed the view that although a number of them have come forward and we appreciate that. I do feel that there must be many out there who know quite a lot, who haven't come forward. Indeed, when the Reverend, uh, Reverend Chikane was here giving evidence last week, we had a discussion about that and he gave me his perspective. But I want you to know that we appreciate when uh, senior officials uh, who, were, who have no 
knowledge of some of the things that really are important for the Commission come forward to help the Commission understand what was happening. So I just want you to, to know that we appreciate that you came. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, Mr. Sheikh, you have in front of you a bundle marked PP1. I do. In that bundle at pages 1 to 15 is an affidavit. Is that your affidavit? That's correct. At page 15, whose signature appears there? It's my signature. And are you satisfied that the contents of this affidavit are true and correct? I am indeed. At page 1, from paragraphs 1 to 9, you tell the Commission some of the matters related to your knowledge and experience and your personal background. Would you just go through those and tell the Chair of your own background, please? Chair, I, uh, in paragraphs 1 to 9, I outline my <coughs> history in respect to intelligence matters, uh, which essentially started uh, as a result of my detention, uh, which led to a intelligence breakthrough for the ANC. And in that capacity, I received training in East Germany. I then returned illegally into the country to set up an intelligence structure. And I worked directly under the supervision and command of former President Jacob Zuma. And as a result of the knowledge I accrued in the so-called underground days of intelligence, I was included into the negotiation process. So I was a, a delegate at CODESA 1, CODESA 2, the multi-party talks. I was nominated to serve on the sub-council of intelligence. I was the chair of the amalgamation committee that amalgamated the various statutory and non-statutory intelligence services in the 1991 to 94 period. I was very much part together with my colleagues in passing the three pieces of legislation uh, that governs the intelligence services. And I'm proud to say that I was also a contributor to the chapter 11 on the Constitution, which is a remarkable first in the world where matters of intelligence were in the constitution of a country. Um, since then, and I then left the intelligence services in 1997. I joined the Department of Foreign Affairs, it was then called Department of Foreign Affairs. I served as a Consul General in Hamburg. I returned, I was then appointed by President Mandela as the ambassador to Algeria. I then returned, uh, served as the special advisor to Ministers Lamini Zuma. Then I left government again, and I returned to government in 2009 in my capacity as Director General of the South African Secret Service. During the period from, or well, prior to 1994, and during period up to 2009, did you have occasion to work with the former president, Zuma? Very much so. And we will deal with some facts in relation to evidence that the former president has given in due course. In paragraph 10, you describe the fact that you were reappointed into the security establishment uh, together with two other persons who are to give evidence today and tomorrow. Tell the court about that. Uh, tell the chair about that, please. That is correct, chair. Um, some point in 2009. Uh, just one second, Mr. Sheikh. I wonder if you can bring the mic just a little bit closer. Yeah. There? I think, yeah. yeah. 
at some point in 2009, I think it was in May 2009, if I may be mistaken, uh, I received a phone call. There was a lot of speculation before that in the media that uh, my colleagues and I may be returning to the intelligence services. And we then received a phone call from the minister's office, from Minister Quader's office, to avail ourselves for a meeting. When we arrived at this meeting, Minister Quader at that time was already minister. He was of already the minister of oh. intelligence. Yes. Yes. It's just that, uh, as I said, I get confused about intelligence and internal security. Yes. Uh, so, so intelligence is the right. Correct. Technology. I would. Uh, I would. Uh, uh, I assist the chair in making that understanding that, of the yes. difference between intelligence yes. and state security agency. Yes, it's just and that I think at a certain time, uh, certain terms were used. Correct. Then at another time, they got changed. Correct. And I don't know whether at some stage there was some kind of splitting of, of yes. parts of the same, what Absolutely was the same correct. before. So that's why sometimes it's... it's yes. We hope it, to deal with that satisfactorily <laughs> in a moment. <laughs> that's why so sometimes... Uh, those of us who are not uh, very familiar with yes. those uh, uh, operations get confused. Yes, yes. thank you. So it will be safe to say, sir, that at the, the beginning of the fifth administration in 2009, the appointment of Minister Krele was appointed as the Minister of State Security. All other ministers prior to 2009 were ministers of intelligence. So in 2009, when uh, former president announced his cabinet, he appointed uh, Minister Kwele as the Minister of State Security. Okay. okay. Yes, that, that's, 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 that's interesting. Yeah. So then... At this meeting at Minister Kwele's office, uh, the three of us, Minister, uh, uh, Mr. Jenje, Ambassador Maka, Tuka, and myself met. We were in a holding room, and this is the first time we have spoken in a long time, and we were all, okay, why are we here? Mm -hmm. And very shortly then, we were led into a, uh, a press conference in which it was announced that Ambassador Matatuka is the Director General of the SSA. Uh, Mr. Gibson would be the head of the domestic branch of the SSA, and I was appointed as the head of the foreign branch of the SSA. You, Thank you. I'm sorry, you, you, I must have missed something. You don't mean that you were sitting in the holding room and then led to a press conference and that was announced without any discussion as yet. Yeah, I must have missed something. Uh, it, was a very, it was a very strange and odd uh, situation. Uh, for me, myself, this is the first time I was hearing that I would be now appointed as the head of the foreign branch. But of course, in the holding room, we did uh, discuss and I think the minister did make a brief appearance to tell us that we are now assuming the responsibility of the management of the intelligence services uh, but that is the way I recall it. Oh, so, so it was just a brief a so very brief thing and then yes, we were led to okay, a press conference. Okay, yes, okay yeah. thank you. Um, if we may take a step out of your statement or affidavit for the moment and go to um, Exhibit PP4. And tab 5 contains certain diagrams and an extract from uh, the Constitution. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Mr. Pretorius. I think you need to explain something with regard to the pagination. You know, I just realized at least with regard to P4, that it seems that its pagination is a kind of standalone pagination and not sequential uh, from 
from the beginning, we normally have pagination that goes from the first page to the last in the, in the bundle. But if this is different, we, I think it's necessary to explain that into the record, yes. but also so that I understand. If I may then, Chair, just note for the record that Exhibit PP4, which contains certain documents relevant to the evidence to be given, is <coughs> paginated from page 1 to page 47. I do note too that the initials RS appear from page 39 onwards, but perhaps it would be better, uh, Chair, if the initials RS were excluded from references and from uh, from the final copy to be corrected. Uh, well, uh, PP4, you say, is, starts from page 1 to whatever, but there's a page, or they, that's just an index what comes before that. Uh, so that's, so from page 1 up to, what is the last page? 47. Okay. Yes, okay. Uh, I think deal with the others as well. Page, uh, so PP1 has its own pa pagination, basically. PP1 starts from page 1 to page 15. Page uh, 16, Jay. Is it 16? Yes. 16 is just the stamp of the Commissioner of Oaths. Well, I don't have 16. And I don't have this stamp. But uh, uh, it's not supposed that there's not supposed to be a stamp of the Commission of Post because it's not an affidavit. So how how come you have? No, it, it is an affidavit, Chair. And if uh, your file has not been updated, I apologise. Um, the statement has been replaced by an affidavit. Oh. Well, that compounds my problem <laughs> because the witness didn't do an oath this morning. He didn't take an oath. He, it was an affirmation. So when I looked at this and said it's a statement, not an affidavit, that was that accorded with him not taking an oath and uh, uh, doing an affirmation. Um, <laughs> well, Chair, the fact is that the statement or affidavit before you was sworn before a commissioner of oaths. I'm not sure whether it was affirmed at all. Well, <laughs> well, well, all I'm saying is, well, not all, but part of what I'm saying is, certainly what I have for Mr. Sheikh is reflected on page one as his statement, statement of Arias Sheikh, and at the beginning, it doesn't say, as affidavits normally do, I hereby make oath and say, it starts the story, I was an anti-apartheid student activist. And at the end of the, the that statement goes up to page 15, and um, there is no commissioner of oath certificate as one would have. So I don't mind being given what is to be used. I just want to make sure that we have the same things. I don't know whether he has an affidavit or he has a statement like I do, but we must have all the same thing. Well, can I explain, Chair? As yes. I explained to you earlier, these statements were taken some time ago. As a precaution, I asked the investigators to have it sworn, uh, which was done. Uh, my understanding is that you have the statement in your file, so your problem uh, doesn't exist yet. <laughs> it's only when the affidavit is filed, so perhaps we'll just leave well, it as if, a statement. Well, if, if you are happy that we, we use a statement, I'm happy. I just want to make sure we have the same thing. Yes. Uh, they are identical documents. Yes. So for the purposes of the evidence, which yeah. is given under affirmation anyway, perhaps we can proceed 
on the basis of the document in your file. Yeah, so that the the transcript doesn't talk about an affidavit and then here it's a statement. Yes, I'll talk about a statement. Yeah, okay, all right. Um, Happy Mr. Sheikh. Mr. Sheikh, Mr. Sheikh, do you understand what's going on? Yes, I, I did. If I could just add a little clarification, yeah. sir. The, it is correct that what you would have because the statement was given a year ago and then in consultation with the, the, the legal leader. team, yeah. it was agreed to turn it into an affidavit. Yes, okay. I must say in the affidavit that I have before me, mm. there are some changes that either the, I neatened it up in terms of instead of long histories, yes, yes. I kept it more precise. Okay. Uh, and there were some typos that you will find and which may which irritate you when you see it yes. uh, has been changed. So, so, if, so if, if both of you have affidavit, have, uh, uh, affidavits, maybe if there is a spare affidavit, I should just have an affidavit, then we all have the same thing. I assume the numbering is the same. The numbering is the same as I understand yeah. it. Well, perhaps you could put this in your file, please, Jim. Yes, that's, that's... It doesn't have to be stapled because it will just go in here as is. Thank you. Uh, and I will now refer to the paragraphs in the affidavit that you have in front of you. Yes, okay, thank you. That is yes. what Mr. Sheikh has and that is what I have and I apologize for the fact that it should have been on your file. Just by way of introduction to the documents after tab 5 in exhibit PP4. Mr. Sheikh, you've told the chair that you were involved in the drafting of chapter 11 of the Constitution. That is correct. And you will obviously understand that once the drafter has released the written section or chapter for promulgation, that's the end of the story as far as the drafters are concerned. Thereafter, it's up to the courts to apply and interpret. Correct. Nevertheless, you can assist us by pointing out not only the various structures to which the DCJ has referred, uh, but you can also highlight some portions of the Constitution and explain um, the thinking, at least behind them, subject to the fact that you can't interpret. Correct. Um, Could you go, please, to... It, 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 I guess it will be necessary for me to have a copy of the Constitution. Yes, you have uh, 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 in PP4... Yes, I are the relevant portions. Chapter uh, 11. Yes. Oh, okay. No, that's uh, page fine. Page 42 then. and follow. Okay. There is an organogram at exhibit PP4, page 39. Do you see it? Yes. <coughs> yes, I do. That is followed by an unnumbered A3 version of that page, which is easier to refer to. That, I understand it, is the organogram that applies to the intelligence services under the Constitution for the period 1994 to 1997. That is correct. I'm sorry, Mr. Pretorius. Oh, you are at 39 of uh, PP4. Yes, 39. It's okay. followed by a larger copy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, which is easier to, to read, Chair. So I, I would suggest that uh, you go to the page after page 39. And you will see an A3 version of page 39. It is intended to put these up on the screen, but in the meanwhile, we can deal with the 
yes. the organogram at page 39. In red, along the bottom of the diagram, are certain entities dealing with intelligence. What are they? Uh, these uh, red blocks represent the different organizations that were created by the National Strategic Intelligence Act uh, and they are the National Intelligence Agency, the NIA, which is responsible for domestic intelligence. Could you pause there a moment. Is the Act, the Intelligence Services Act 38 of 1994? The Act that defined the, the mandates of the various intelligence components is the National Strategic Intelligence Act 39 of 1994. And that is the act referred to on the right-hand side of those four blocks? That is correct. Right. That created four entities. What are those entities? You just go through them again, please. The National Intelligence Agency, responsible for the collection of domestic intelligence, right. and also had the counterintelligence function. Okay. The next one? The next one is the South African Secret Service. And the South African Secret Service was responsible for the collection of intelligence outside the borders of South Africa, foreign intelligence, so to speak. And then the next is crime intelligence. The next is crime intelligence, and that refers to the intelligence gathered by the police in respect of prosecuting uh, domestic crime or international crime. And the final one is military intelligence. And Military intelligence is intelligence required by the military for the deployment of troops and for their state of readiness. You will see that above the National Intelligence Agency, which you say deals with domestic intelligence and counterintelligence, and the South African Secret Service, which deals with foreign intelligence, a reporting line to the National Intelligence Coordinating Committee. What is that? Well, Mr. Mr. Pretorius, before we get there, I just want to make sure that I understand the, dis the differences in functions of the different uh, units or agencies. National Intelligence Agency, you say that deals with what? That deals with the domestic intelligence. So in other words, intelligence inside of the country that re where the bulk of the issues relates to domestic issues, whether they are political unrest, whether it is uh, the reasons why we have unrest in the country, uh, the crime uh, networks, the cartels, etc. Mm. So it is... Uh, an Others could be on how government is perceived, how it is uh, the domestic component of intelligence is what we call the NIA's function. Mm -hmm. And included that, they would have the function of counterintelligence. Mm -hmm. So in other words, any threat directed towards the state, organs of the state, individuals of the state, uh, that would be the function of the NIA to be able to count, firstly identify the threat and then counter that threat. And broadly we refer to that as counterintelligence. So counterintelligence uh, would be what the NIA does to deal with, um, for example, people planning to overthrow the government. Yes. Yeah, that, that, ki that kind yes. of thing. But and we would know they also serious, as, uh, there would yeah. be less serious things that they would deal with as well. Correct. They are the serious things and the less serious yeah, things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I mean, part of what they would look at would part of what they would be concerned with uh, be crime, and how would they, how would their function differ from crime intelligence? Yes. The Yes, there is a measure of overlap mm -hmm. uh, to the extent that the criminal network becomes sophisticated and a, and a good example will be the drug cartels. Mm -hmm. The movement of drugs, uh, and a, a very good example is, and I hope I get it right, 
mm. the the drug naupe mm. which is decimating our our mm. townships and our cities mm. etc mm. and naupe is a heroin based drug mm. and heroin is a product of a plant mm. grown in afghanistan pakistan mm. etc mm. and that is that part of the world mm. we are here in in africa mm. the that drug has to come from afghanistan pakistan through mm. here and most times it enters the east coast mm. uh, of the indian ocean mm. and then through various countries smuggled in mm. into south africa mm. so you can see just in that example mm. how foreign intelligence mm. would be used to monitor the flow of these drugs mm. and when it enters the country here it mm. enters a distribution network mm. so you can see now how the the domestic intelligence will get involved in the distribution network mm. to understand the distribution network mm. and then eventually when the drugs are sold and the money's flow because mm. money's will also flow in the reverse process mm. you will get the financial intelligence center getting involved you'll get the the NIA getting involved in mm. respect of that and when it is now prosecuted as a crime mm. that is when crime intelligence gets involved so so the the south african secret service which i think you said deals with uh, international or foreign uh, side of intelligence so they could be involved in monitoring the movement of naupe from afghanistan or wherever uh, and for example get to know that it's destined for our shores yes and and then they could then share that information with the nia so that when it lands on our shores the nia is ready to deal with it absolutely correct yes and then when the nia deals with it it could end up uh, with crime intelligence and ultimately with saps and uh, in the courts yes that is correct sir yes that was the the way it was designed yes and then if you look at the red line and maybe i'm just getting ahead of the evidence leader yes yes but if but you look I, I at the i just want to understand yeah the red structures and above that is the national intelligence coordinating committee yes yes and that is a the committee that was designed to share this kind of intelligence both tactical intelligence yes and at the strategic level yes okay 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 so so crime intelligence um i i think i i understand uh, the southern secret service from what the examples that we have yes. just used but crime intelligence from what you say it looks like in the examples that we have used would wouldn't would only get involved after nia had been involved in terms of those examples but uh, in terms of other crimes it could act as um an intelligence uh, unit of first instance if you if you if you understand what i mean absolutely correct yes. let's just take another example in the case of uh atm uh mm. atm bombs uh, yeah yeah yes. there the crime intelligence yes. would deploy its resources yes. to get to know who are behind that mm. etc mm. and they would then request mm. to the 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 civilian intelligence community mm. uh technological support mm. Uh, mm. which is then given to to crime intelligence when they are leading the investigation mm. Mm. and the military intelligence really would relate to who who wants to attack us or what, as a country or what yes so so you'll recall that in our awful history of apartheid we had structures created under military intelligence mm. and a, a good example would be the ccb mm. uh which engaged in extrajudicial killings mm. in the country mm. so that one of the key civil cooperation bureau that's the civil cooperation bureau mm. so one of the key principles that emerged during the negotiations was that the military will not be able to conduct intelligence inside of the country mm. and this was a a and it still remains a fascinating discussion mm. 
uh, because any institution that when it deploys has to rely on its own intelligence. Mm -hmm. it, it does not invariably rely on other people's intelligence mm -hmm. when it is deploying. Mm -hmm. So it is easy in the case of the military when they are involved in operations outside of the country. Mm -hmm. Military intelligence will inform mm -hmm. the terrain, the gathering, the <coughs> that informs the deployment of the military outside the country. Of course, the difficulty will arise and, and we would have such a situation in the call to deploy the military inside the country. Then the question will remain what intelligence will the military re rely on when it deploys inside the country. But at that time, we didn't envisage that contradiction and we believe that through the mechanism of NICOC, the coordinating mechanism, that we would be able to best resolve that issue if and when it arose. Well, I know that I, <coughs> I just said that I take it that military intelligence is about intelligence relating to who wants to attack us. Yes, but, uh, <coughs> uh, which is rather um, from outside the borders of the country. Um, but now, if uh, we want to know, or the president wants to know whether within the country there is a group of people who are planning to go to the headquarters of the SANDF and um, uh, kidnap the general uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> and, and other senior mm. uh, military leaders and uh, go on radio and television and say we have taken over the government of South Africa. If he wants to know whether there are people within the country who would uh, be expected to pick up that kind of intelligence or is it all of them? Or would the military intelligence be expected to pick that up no. themselves? The, in the main, sir, that will be the function perhaps of the counterintelligence of the NIA and to some extent crime intelligence. Uh, but let me just assure you firstly that I don't think there's anyone willing to attack South Africa. <laughs> uh, and secondly, those who want to take over the headquarters must first know where the headquarters is. Yes. Uh, and we get that wrong sometimes. Yes. <laughs> okay, no, that's, that, 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 that's all right. So, so the military intelligence, intelligence is outward looking. Correct. And um, the, uh, the, the NIA is inward looking. Correct. The South African Secret Service outward looking. And crime intelligence in, in, inward looking. And it too. may have a combination inward and inward outward. And outward. Yeah. And military outward looking. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. I think I understand uh, better now. Thank, Thank you. you. We will deal with the reporting lines yes. and oversight yes. uh, in addition. Okay. Um, uh, but before we do that, these four entities that you've referred to share joint services, as I understand it, including uh, technological services like interception, monitoring, and the like. In the, in the case of uh, crime intelligence and military intelligence, uh, there is a capacity by the civilian intelligence that has intercept capacities, and a structure was created for request from the military intelligence and crime intelligence to this structure to intercept on behalf of uh, crime intelligence and military uh, intelligence. And those and other joint services such as training uh, and the like, internal security, in other, words, in other words the security of the operatives and the entities are to an extent, as you've explained, shared services. Uh, the joint services pertain to the National Intelligence Agency and the South African Secret Service. The, the crime intelligence was a division of the South African Police Service and they have their own organizational culture, training, etc. Uh, to the extent that sometimes there is cooperation, yes, but these joint services in this diagram represents the, the joint services that were prevalent in 1994 between the NIA and the South African Secret Service. And you've explained that crime intelligence and military intelligence may request 
certain that's correct. technological assistance from uh, National Intelligence Agency and the South African Secret Service. That's correct. You've told the chair that these entities report for coordination and cooperation to the National Intelligence Coordinating Committee. That is correct. And it seems from the diagram that you explain that that committee reports to an intelligence coordinator who in turn reports to the president. Yes. I must, I must point out, sir, that this was all applicable in the 1994-1997 period. Yes. Things have changed since then. Yes, sure. Yes. Okay. The crime intelligence resorts under the South African Police Service, reporting in turn to the Minister of Police. Correct. And military intelligence resorts under the South African National Defence Force, under the direction of the Minister of Defence. That is correct. For oversight purposes, in other words, oversight I'm, I'm over sorry. the activities... I'm sorry, Mr. Pretorius. Am I missing something on this token ground? Uh, uh, because I don't seem to see the Minister of Intelligence I see Minister of Justice, Minister of Police, Minister of Defense, Intelli Intelligence Coordinator reporting directly to the President. Yes. Am I? Uh, no, it's correct. I'm not missing anything. No, you're not. Oh. Mr. Sheikh will explain that. Will explain. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, that, that came from the fact that I thought the Minister would report to the President, but then there is a coordinator. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, I see it's 11.20. I'm not sure when you would want to take the short adjournment. We can take the short adjournment now or we can take it at half past 10, half past 11. Uh, we did start at half past 11. In terms of what you want to cover, does it matter? Well, it'll take some time to go through these because there are two more diagrams to oh. go through. So it's this is the situation to 1997. It changed in 1997. Yes. And changed once again in 2009. Yes. It's very confusing, so it's yes. quite important to... So maybe it's better that we actually take the tea adjournment and then continue yes. after that. Okay, all right. We'll take the tea adjournment now. It's 20 past 11. We'll resume at 25 to 12. We adjourn. Thank you. All rise.
Yes, let's proceed. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Sheikh, we will see in the diagrams to follow that indeed there is a minister responsible for intelligence, uh, <clears throat> two different designations over time. But would you explain to the Chair, please, why on this organogram, uh, 1994 to 1997, uh, there's no minister that appears to be directly related to intelligence. Chair, the, the issue arose during the negotiation process. Um, how best should the intelligence services be managed and controlled? Uh, and during the negotiation process that led to the sub-council of intelligence, a set of principles were agreed upon, and these principles then were reflected in the Constitution and in the legislation. It was never envisaged that we would have a fully-fledged minister. And if I draw your attention to the various sections of the Constitution, in, in respect of defense, we will get there. Oh, we will get there. Yes. Okay. So, there was never envisaged that there would be a dedicated Minister of Intelligence. And in 1994, under the then President uh, Mandela, the Minister of Justice assumed the administrative responsibility for the intelligence services, not the direction and the control in terms of the substance of their work, but in respect of the administrative matters, the budget matters, the uh, appointment matters, the regulation matters, but not the control of the intelligence process itself. Well, Mr. Pretorius, I think it's, it's convenient that before we proceed, uh, I see the structure in the interim constitution to the extent that what you say is how it was reflected in the Constitution. Obviously, the administrative uh, power of the Minister of Justice maybe might not be in the Constitution, but I would like to see that and then see how uh, even the final Constitution is structured before we proceed, because then I think I will understand some of the explanations that you give better. Yes, Chair. We had intended to go through chapter 11 in some detail, so if we may do that, mm -hmm. and some of the concerns or questions you've raised will be answered in that process, mm -hmm. then we can go back to the diagrams. Yes, no, that's fine. Let's, let's do that. Even if uh, we just look at simply the structure to say, look at this here, the main features, this is not there, this is there, this is what this might mean, and then later on we can go back if necessary. also have in here uh, relevant parts of the interim constitution. We, we just deal not. with the chapter the, 11 the final. of the final constitution. Yeah, but uh, there was no difference, do you know? The, no. the principles Were to the which same. the uh, final witness now refers are in the final constitution. Oh, okay, all right. So where do I find the relevant uh, parts of the constitution? Page in the 42. Page 42. Of PP4. Yes. I'd like to deal with the governing principles because in 198D there's an um, important provision in relation to the structures. And uh, just for the record, what we are looking at now is Chapter 11 of the final constitution. Yes. Okay. There are certain governing principles that were established in the constitution in relation to Chapter 11 security services. What are those provisions? And I'd like to put all those on record through you 
Mr. Sheikh, particularly 198D. The following principles govern national security in the Republic. A. National security must reflect the resolve of South Africans as individuals and as a nation to live as equals, to live in peace and harmony, to be free from fear, and want to seek a better life. B. The resolve to live in peace and harmony precludes any South African citizen from participating in armed conflict, nationally or internationally, except as provided for in terms of the Constitution or national legislation. Three, or C, national security must be pursued in compliance with the law, including international law. And D, national security is subject to the authority of Parliament and the national executive. The important thing in A was a major shift in the paradigm that we adopted in this Constitution. Essentially, A refers to what we call human security, where the national security of the country is pursued through human security, the security of the citizens, free from fear, free from want. Um, it is remarkably distinct from state security, which is the purview or the paradigm that governed apartheid where people were uprising in the country because of apartheid policies, the intelligence paradigm of that time was concerned with the security of the state. Or a particular government. Or a particular government. Or particular officials within government. Exactly. Exactly. And whereas here is a fundamental constitutional shift where the constitution puts an obligation to pursue national security through human security of South African citizens. Uh, the reference to the state as opposed to the reference to uh, a particular government of the day. Yes. For my, 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 would it be pursuing the security of the state as opposed to the security of a particular government of the day, uh, to what extent would it be different from human security in so far if it is done properly? Yes, that's a, a very interesting distinction, sir. Mm -hmm. the, the understanding of human security is that we would address the concerns and the fears and the wants of, of your citizens. Let, let me give you an example. We have uh, incredible public service delivery protest. And public service delivery protest is a direct result of the lack of poor services. The solution to that is not to look at those who are agitating for the protest. The solution to that is to address the issues of the poor public service delivery. And that is a classical distinction between human security and what we'll call state security, where you are protecting. Of course, the police would have to protect the institutions. Uh, for example, when our trains get burnt, uh, there's a fair amount of intelligence that's required to prevent that. But ultimately, the, the solution to that problem rests in ensuring that there's efficient train services and efficient and able and capable and affordable train services. So if you put too much emphasis on the protection of the state's assets or the government's assets, you are forgetting the most fundamental thing, what is the reason why this is happening. Um, I, I kind of qualified my question by saying if uh, those who are, supposed, who are responsible for state security do their job properly, what I had in mind is there would be no state without people. Correct. 
and the state must look after its people. Yes. And therefore, whether one can say, even if you speak of state security, if the understanding is the correct understanding, would it not lead to those people looking after the citizens properly as well? Absolutely correct. Yes. Absolutely correct. Okay. okay. It goes to how you understand yes. the function of security. Yes. yes. And here what, what the founders of the Constitution felt that it was important to put the correct perspective yes. on how national yes. security should be viewed. Yes. And, and I, guess, uh, I guess that uh, it may have been necessary to put it that way even if it was an option to put it as state security on the understanding that after 94, state security would be seen as including the security of the people. Yes. It may have been necessary to put it that way in order to emphasize what was not emphasized before. Correct. Yes. Okay. Correct. Thank you. 198B, Mr. Sheikh, deals with the issue of armed conflict both within the borders and internationally. Yes. Um, the principle in relation to what one may term extra or constitutional armed force, what does this principle say about that? The, and again, this is influenced by historical context. Much of the the paradigm to keep apartheid alive meant destabilizing countries outside of South Africa, where it was envisaged that liberation forces had military bases. In a classical example, we will know that in Mozambique, you had tremendous amount of funding going from the then South African Defense Force to forces, and I just don't want to name them, but perhaps I could, uh, say you went to Ranamo, which was a counterinsurgency uh, outfit in Mozambique that was engaging in the destabilization of the nascent uh, party, the Furlimo party uh, that took power in 1997 in uh, Mozambique, or 94, I mean, uh, 74. 74, 74, 74 yes. yes. Uh -huh. So we then had a situation where South Africans were engaged in armed conflict outside of South Africa uh, and they were considered to be mercenaries and what we wanted in our constitution is to avoid South Africans getting involved in international conflicts where they are selling their services as mercenaries. So as a result of that a, a law was passed that prohibited that in the main and there were certain conditions that had to, you had to apply before you engage in that kind of activity. And what does the section say for present purposes, for present purposes um, in relation to the employment of armed conflict within South Africa? Armed conflict in South Africa? Yes. The, uh, for example, um, uh, the arming of uh, certain groups in order to attain certain objects within South Africa. It's absolutely forbidden and illegal yeah. and should be prosecuted. Then C um, and D in particular, um, perhaps you could explain uh, 198 D in relation to the oversight responsibilities in relation to the operations and perhaps to um, expenditure in relation to security entities. Again, again said that the intelligence and security in, in the apartheid era had certain features which was uh, unacceptable for us as we entered, a, as we wanted to construct a new paradigm. For example, intelligence or security could not be a law unto itself. Uh, and the Nuremberg doctrine of uh, I just followed an order or I just followed a command, we wanted to make sure that, that none of that applies in our democracy. So we then said 
that national security must be subject to the authority of parliament. So parliament should be fully involved in the affairs of intelligence, in the affairs of security, so that parliament is kept abreast of what is happening, including the budget, including money allocations, including operations. And we came up with a particular formula in which for that to happen. And you'll notice that we, we created the, under the National Strategic Inte uh, the, uh, Intelligence Oversight Act, we created for the first time in South Africa two important institutions. The first is the institution of a joint standing committee of intelligence, which are then called the JC, JSCI. It's a multi-party committee that has full access to all that intelligence does and has full access to uh, the records of the intelligence uh, community, the budget, etc. And so through a joint standing committee in parliamentary intelligence, and we found creative mechanisms to get around some of the, the obligations of democracy and balancing transparency and uh, accountability. Uh, I think those members are vetted, in parliament are vetted. They go through a process, they go through an induction on how to deal with the secret information. So that is the, the first. The second mechanism was the appointment of the Inspector General of Intelligence. Now, we saw the Inspector General of Intelligence as a kind of intelligence ombud that uh, where the public, where the public who feels aggrieved by any uh, misconduct of the intelligence service would have a office, an instrument to be able to raise matters. And we so felt that the founders of the Constitution felt it such important a institution that it put an obligation that uh, it was put in the Constitution and under Section 210 of the Constitution, it reads that 210B, civilian monitoring of the activities of those services by an Inspector General appointed by the President as head of the National Executive and approved by a resolution adopted by the National Assembly with a supporting vote of at least two-thirds of its members. Now, the two-third uh, barrier was a very high barrier to set. Uh, it was not by simple majority, it's not by 60%, by two-thirds. Uh, because, the, again, the founders of the intelligence, uh, or the founders of the Constitution wanted to ensure that it is accepted by almost all of, of Parliament in the choice uh, of the person in the Inspector General's office. So those are the two institutions of oversight and the Act was the Intelligence uh, Services Oversight Act that was passed. There may be further questions when we revert to the diagram in yes. relation to detail of the structure, but for the moment would you please deal with Section 199 of the final constitution which deals with the establishment, structuring and conduct of security services. So under the, uh, the, the establishment, um, we defined under section 1991, the security services of the Republic consist of a single defense force, a single police service, and any intelligence services established in terms of the Constitution. So, no intelligence service could be born if unless established by the Constitution, and there's a particular power that is given to the President to do so, and there's a condition that limits the power of the President in the establishing of uh, such a service. I would, do, I would come to that later. Yes. Okay. Uh, I see that... Uh uh, the Constitution is emphatic that in terms of the defense force is a single defense force, in terms of the police is a single police service, but it has, doesn't have that emphasis for intelligence service. Is, is, that, uh, is that in accordance with what the yes, discussions it's, were? Yes, it's, it's in accordance with the discussions, yes. and it was envisaged that um, 
that intelligence will be a national capability, so there was going to be no uh, uh, no provinces could establish an own intelligence service, and therefore it was insisted that only by the constitution. And of course this is a clever way to write it, because if you look at the, the president's power, only the president can establish an intelligence service, and only in keeping with national legislation, but we will get, get to that later, yeah? Okay, thank you. And then from 1992 onwards? So 1992 onwards, uh, again, it establishes the Defense Force as the only lawful military force in the Republic. Uh, other than the security services established in terms of the Constitution, armed organization or services may be established only in terms of national legislation. Um, the security services must be structured and regulated by national legislation. The security services must act and must teach and require their members to act in accordance with the Constitution and law, including customary international law and international agreements binding on the Republic. No member of the security services may obey a manifestly illegal order. I Neither understand um, that subsections 1995 and 1996 are informed again by our history. Yes, informed by our history and we wanted, uh, we wanted to remove completely the ignorance of the law. So no intelligence service member must be able to say I did not know the law and therefore the obligation was placed on the intelligence or the security services of which the intelligence services are part of to teach and train its members not only on the constitution but also in terms of international law and other other law. So it was a requirement to ensure uh, that our new intelligence services or the new security services were going to act in, in the spirit of the Constitution and to uphold the Constitution in its entirety. Well, uh, wasn't there actually a slight uh, qualification in, in, in the reason for it, namely not, not, not that uh, you didn't want any member of the security services to say, I didn't know the law, because that might be fine when it can't be said that you must have known this was illegal. Mm. Yes. So in other words, uh, and the probability is that what you wanted to do is to prevent people from carrying out manifestly illegal orders because even when they so realize that this order is illegal, they could say, well, if I'm instructed by the commander, mm. if I'm instructed by uh, somebody occupying that position, what yes. can I do? Yes. So they know it's illegal, but because of where the order comes from, they might say I had no choice. Yes. You wanted them to you wanted to say, once the order is manifestly illegal, you can't say, because it came from somebody in a particular position, yes. uh, you couldn't do it. Yes. But where you, in good faith, didn't think there was anything illegal with the order, then you stand in a different place altogether. Correct. But where it's manifestly illegal, that's what you wanted yeah. to deal with. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And, and you're absolutely right, sir, and that is why it's in both cases where it is not manifestly illegal, then our teachings of our members of the law should equip them to make the right decision. Yes, yes. And where it is manifestly illegal, they have a constitutional obligation not to obey that. So we felt very strongly about it, so you're yes. absolutely correct. No, thank you. Um, Chair, if I may just say at this stage this detail um, as you appreciate obviously is important because it informs the constitutional standard against which the conduct which will be given 
um, in evidence or testified to in evidence uh, over a period of time and the Commission must be judged. Um, subsection 1997 is also instructive. It is indeed. Explain that, please. It reads, neither the security services nor any of their members may in the performance of their function, A, prejudice a political party's interest that is legitimate in terms of the Constitution, or B, further in a partisan manner any interest of a political party. Now again, these were important principles that informed the negotiations, and there was Given our past, we wanted to bring the intelligence services and the security services out of the realm of politics and the political machinations. And we thought it was so important that it must be uh, put in the Constitution where you can neither further an interest in, in a negative way or further it even in a positive way. Uh, and this placed tremendous obligation on all of the members of the services in the 1994 period because we all came from a political history. I for one came from the ANC but it meant that henceforth once I joined the service my conduct uh, in regard to an intelligence uh, officer had to be incredibly distinct from my conduct as a member of the ANC and I could not in any way uh, through my intelligence services work favor or prejudice the ANC or any other political party. And this has uh, given rise to a, a huge debate, at least in my mind, on the very concept of what's called political intelligence when it comes to political parties and whether in, in the developed world it is considered illegal and unethical to monitor political parties and what is going on in political parties. That is the subject of politics and democracy which intelligence services should not get involved in, including, including if there are members in, of a political party that wishes through its own reasoning wanting to, to replace a sitting president of the, that party uh, and as long as they do it legally and as long as they do it within the strictures of democracy, intelligence services have no basis to monitor even that. I guess that uh, uh, in the provisions of section 1997 A and B. Uh, well, the, the, they talk about a party, but uh, you just referred to a situation where some people in a party might be yes. wanting to unseat the president of that party, and as you, you say, as long as they do, do it legally and constitutionally, you know, intelligence services should have no business to be involved there. Correct. Um, so this provides a basis, does it not, for any member of the intelligence services who would engage in any conduct to advance the interests of any party particular political party um, that he or she would be acting in breach of this and pro possibly the relevant legislation as well. Um, they, they, that should be none of their business as long as uh, it's done within the principles of democracy and uh, within the confines of the law. That is correct, sir. Yes, and if it happens, it's just um, a breach of these constitutional provisions and whatever may be in legislation. That is correct, sir. Um, uh, this talks about a party uh, and doesn't talk about uh, an individual. 
maybe if, when we go to the legislation there might be individuals as well I'm not sure so if if I am uh, the head of the military intelligence or no maybe I'm not the head of, of the military intelligence if I am a possible candidate for head of intelli military intelligence and I want to be appointed as head of in military intelligence can I say to the president I assume it's the president who appoints the head of military intelligence is that so uh, no. no no okay <laughs> maybe it's a wrong it's a wrong it's a wrong uh, so maybe, use maybe the NIA example the oh, okay <laughs> maybe NIA yeah. yes yeah. if I say to the president uh, you know if I get appointed as head of NIA uh, I will look after you mm. or anything like that mm. or I will make sure that ABC does happen which will be in your favor mm. that's clearly wrong clearly wrong and clearly in breach of of, of of some legislation indeed it is yes okay and let me just mm. touch on a very important point in respect to that sir the different people perceive intelligence remarkably different some people see intelligence as you know the dark arts you are there to keep them in power by predicting the future etc and that is a, a really antiquated concept of intelligence and those who believe in that concept of intelligence invariably get things awfully wrong but that is a a, a subject matter for another time well, well uh, I'm hoping that as we continue at some stage we'll talk more about 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 about, sure. about those things because uh, you know it's often said uh, about our country that it's got the right constitution it's got the right legislation it's got the right policies but things go horribly wrong with implementation and um, and one of the things that I have publicly said many many times before that I believe uh, should be looked at by this commission is the question of whether as a member of parliament who belongs to a particular political party when you are supposed to perform your duties there including duties that may relate to votes of no confidence and uh, impeachment and so on can your party say to you if irrespective of what you think is right or wrong this is how you must vote and what do you do if your party say let's say uh, your party says vote in this way but you believe that that's not in accordance with the constitution you believe that holding the particular the executive accountable means that you must vote differently but it's your party that has sent your name to parliament mm. yeah. what do you do it raises the same question in a certain way that you have touched on to say uh, when you are in intelligence you are not supposed to be uh, advancing the interests of any political party mm. you are supposed to be just doing your job you in accordance with the constitution and the law but there may be expectations take your yourself as uh, with your background in the ANC and the struggle there may be expectations from certain people your comrades who were in the trenches with you who think okay now that we've got him there uh, so he will have to remember that he comes from us he's one of us he must remember uh, 
uh, even maybe that we put him there mm. and therefore they might have certain expectations which might not accord with what the constitution says and what the law says and uh, to what extent do these situations which give rise to these challenges to what extent have they had a role to play in putting our country where it is now in relation to levels of corruption in relation to allegations of state capture and so on so it becomes important because maybe in certain circumstances people feel torn between uh, acting in a certain way and acting in a certain way and it may be that some of those things need to be looked at so I, I just give you that context yes. so that you may understand why I'm saying in regard to what you said we might need later on to deal with it and let me have the benefit of your views on it thank you well, sir. thank you thank you mr. Sheikh uh, section 1998 uh, importantly deals with principles of transparency and particularly for the evidence to be led in due course uh, before the Commission accountability. Uh, what does section 1998 provide and what was the thinking behind it? The, do I need it to, to read it in, Please, into I the record? Okay. So 1998 to give effect to the principles of transparency and accountability, multi-party parliamentary committees must have oversight of all security services in a manner determined by national legislation or the rules and orders of parliament. Yes, if I may just emphasize the must, it's not must. optional. It's not an option. Yeah. Yes. The, you're absolutely correct, sir. The, it's not an option. It's a must. Uh, and again, the reason being that we wanted in our young democracy at the time uh, for all parties to, to have a level of comfort that the workings of the intelligence services or the security services are in keeping with the values enshrined in the Constitution and that we are consistent with the code of conduct expected of the security services given the history of our past. So there was no attempt to hide the security services away from Parliament. In fact, a lot went into the thinking about ensuring that Parliament plays a proper role of oversight over the security services, and that, that was the thinking. Yes, and that would include oversight over expenditure? Oversight over expenditure as well, correct. So to the best of my understanding, in the case of the police, the military and the intelligence services, these oversight committees do exist and these oversight committees have access to the budgets and are required to make an input prior to budget uh, allocations. Before we go to section 209 and to section 210 which deal specifically with intelligence, you will recall earlier this morning the issue of a responsible cabinet minister or a responsible president arose in relation to the Defence Force Police and Intelligence Services. And in that respect, you were about to refer to Section 2011 in relation to defence and 2061 in relation to policing. Yes. If, if we look at Section 2011 under the title Political uh, Responsibility, a member of cabinet must be responsible for defense. That is 201. And I'll quickly read out 2061. Again, under police, under the section Political Responsibility, 2061 says a member of the cabinet must be responsible for policing and must determine national policing policy after consulting the provincial governments and taking into account the policing needs and priorities of the provinces as determined by the provi uh, provincial executives. So in both the case of the defense and the police, the constitution stipulates that there must be 
a member of cabinet responsible for that. Perhaps well, it's appropriate to go to 2091 um, and highlight the differences. Before that, and maybe what you are referring to uh, gives an answer. I haven't looked at the Constitution uh, before there is, before the President, after elections, announces his or her cabinet. Uh, all the executive power is vests in him or her. Yes. And then when he or she has announced the cabinet, members of the cabinet, then, uh, then uh, uh, effectively he gives uh, powers to various ministers to deal with various things because there is legislation that says what the minister of this and that will do. But uh, what I, I'm not sure about is the reference here to a member of the cabinet is yes. supposed to exclude the president because otherwise normally I would imagine that um, yes. uh, the cabinet, the president is part of the cabinet but he is the one who puts it together. But I may be mistaken in that regard. Maybe, maybe the cabinet are the ministers and he is simply referred to as president. Mm. Uh, is, is that something that you, you, yes. you have applied your mind to? So the, you, Sim, I'm, I'm raising it simply because the reference to a member of the cabinet yes. immediately suggests they are talking about the minister. But if the president is also a member of the cabinet, then technically it might not have the significance that I may have thought it has. Yes. Because wow. the, if the president is a member of the cabinet, then there is always a member of the cabinet who is responsible for all of these. It's a, you a, might or might not yeah. be able to say something. Yeah. I'm just That's asking. That's a fascinating interpretation, I must say. <laughs> but let, let me give you the interpretation I understood at the time, or the reasoning, not the interpretation, the reasoning. Uh, we wanted to avoid a situation where the president assumes the responsibility as minister of police, or the president assumes the responsibility as a minister of defense, as is in the case of certain countries, where the president is also the minister of defense. Uh, in, in the South African situation, and especially through the negotiations, we specifically wanted to avoid the presidential assumption of the military and police power, and therefore wrote it in this way, uh, that a member of cabinet must be responsible for defense, understanding that it is a member other than the president. I guess what is possible is that in the Constitution, I think in the Constitution there is a section which says who the cabinet is, and I suspect it includes the president, but what the difference, what may be important is that whenever the, the Constitution intends to refer to the president, maybe it uses president, and therefore maybe to, whenever it says member of cabinet, it refers to a minister, maybe, I don't, I don't know whether yeah. also deputy president, but um, deputy ministers are not members of cabinet, as I understand the position. Uh, so, so maybe whenever it says member of cabinet, it means a minister. Correct. When it, when it, when it intends to refer to the president, maybe it always says president. I don't know if Mr. Um, Victoria has found something. Chair, chapter 5 deals with the president and national executive, section 84 deals with certain powers and functions of the president mm -hmm. in his capacity as president or her capacity as president. Mm -hmm. And section 85 deals with the executive authority of the republic, which is also vested in the president, but exercised uh, together with other members of cabinet. Now, that is at a high and general level and may not yes. answer specific questions directly. Yes. But those are the oh. two sections. Okay, no, that's fine. Probably the answer may well be that when it is intended to include the president in a particular function, the constitution refers to the president, and when it intends to intends ministers, it says member of cabinet responsible for police or for health and that kind of thing. 
uh, it might not be particularly significant, but I just noted it yes. in the context of, Correct. The, of Mr. Sheikh's evidence. Yes. What is uh, instructive to is section 91, which deals with the cabinet mm -hmm. and affords the president the power to appoint and assign powers and functions mm. to ministers. Mm. But <coughs> against uh, mm -hmm. 91, 1, 2, and 3, but what is instructive about the sections to which Mr. Sheikh is now referring is that there is a specific provision in the Constitution in relation to police and in relation to defense, which stipulates uh, that there must be a minister and stipulates their powers at a constitutional level rather than at a level of the discretion of the president. That's oh, correct. okay. So they, yeah, there is a specific provision. Yes, that, and I, I think, think that, that is the point that okay, is that is correct. Yes. Well, I just uh, see in nine, section 91.1 of the Constitution that actually the president is part of the of the cabinet because it says the cap cabinet consists of the president as head of the cabinet, uh, a deputy president and ministers. So, so it seems that cabinet includes the president, but maybe that the answer lies in what I said earlier on that. Uh, maybe when specific provisions uh, or functions are allocated to the president, it maybe it refers to the president. But at least, uh, at least the one thing we sh we know is that cabinet does include the president. Yes. Okay. And importantly, uh, Mr. Sheikh, in contrast to those two sections to which you've just referred dealing with the member of cabinet being responsible for defense and a member of cabinet being responsible for policing together with certain other obligations. You have section 209, 1 and 2, which differ fundamentally in principle from those two sections in relation to the powers of the president uh, as concerns intelligence services. Perhaps you could just read 209, 1 and 2 and then explain, please. So under section 209.1, any intelligence service other than any intelligence division of the defense force or police service may be established only by the president as a head of the national executive and only in terms of national legislation. Two, the president as the head of the national executive must appoint a woman or a man as the head of each intelligence service established in terms of subsection 1 and must either assume political responsibility for the control and the direction of any of those services or designate a member of the cabinet to assume that responsibility. So the, the first part is that the president, only the president can establish an intelligence service and only in terms of national legislation. National legislation should come first, be debated by parliament, and then the president can establish it in terms of that national legislation. So there's a link. So the, 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 the president's power to establish intelligence services is limited in my opinion. Second, the president, unlike the constitutional provisioning that says in the case of the defense they must be a member of cabinet in the case of police they must be a member of cabinet and the intelligence it places the obligation on the president to assume the responsibility of the intelligence services or designate a member of the cabinet to assume that function. Now, so our he has understanding. A, he has a choice or discretion in relation to secret, sec, uh, uh, secret, secret services. Yes. Uh, or intelligence. Correct. The president. But he has no choice on police and defense. Absolutely correct. Yes. And there's a slight uh, preference, and the slight preference is that 
he's got to assume the responsibility. Yes. Right? Yes. Uh, so yes. the default is that he assumes yes. it yes. or he can uh, yes. Yes. designate yes. it to a member yes. of the cabinet. Now, I'm not going to seek an interpretation <laughs> of the word of the cabinet, <laughs> but uh, my understanding is that yeah. it is a member of the cabinet already. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so you have two diametrically opposed approaches. The one approach in relation to the police and the defense is that, in effect, the president must never take assume responsibility of either of those. In regard to intelligence services, uh, uh, if I say secret services, is that, yes, is that still yeah, fine? Yeah. Okay. In regard to that, there is a preference, as you put it, for the president to be the one who takes that responsibility. Correct. But there is an acknowledgement that he has a lot of responsibilities and he might prefer that a member of somebody else should be responsible. Then, in that case, he is directed to designate a member of cabinet to take that responsibility. That's correct, sir. Okay, thank you. And yes, perhaps, Mr. Pretorius. And perhaps then we will then come back to the diagram to see why there was a Minister of Justice. Yes, yes. yes. But, yeah, we, yeah. We're about to do so, but okay. perhaps for the sake of completeness, we should just deal briefly with oversight provided for in Section 210. You've already referred to Section 210, but let's deal with it nevertheless. Okay, so under the, the powers and functions and monitoring, Section 210, national legislation must regulate the objects, powers, and the functions of the intelligence services, including any intelligence division of the defense force or the police service, and must provide for A, the coordination of all intelligence services, and B, civilian monitoring of the activities of those services by an inspector appointed by the president as the head of the national executive and provide by a resolution adopted by the national assembly with a supporting vote of at least two-thirds of its members. And approved by a resolution. And approved, yes. yeah. Correct. So whatever presidential and ministerial powers exist in the Constitution, it is quite clear that there must be parliamentary oversight. Absolutely. Clear. Through specific mechanisms provided for by Parliament. That is correct. Would you um, go back to the diagrams, unless there's any further questions <coughs> you want to raise, Chair? Uh, uh, the provisions of the Constitution that we have been looking at are those of the final Constitution. Earlier on we had some discussion, I was asking about the interim constitution and as I understood the position, it was that uh, 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 the principles in the final constitution were the same as those in the interim constitution. I'm wondering whether that is correct now, and uh, now that here um, it does contemplate the possibility that the, a member of cabinet may uh, be responsible for intelligence uh, or whether what was meant was under the interim constitution it was the same principles but the president at that time had elected not to designate a minister for for the, the for for intelligence, despite the fact that constitutionally he could have done so, but what may have happened since then is that the successive presidents have elected to always designate a minister for intelligence. That is why, therefore, um, between ninety four and ninety seven the organogram didn't reflect any minister responsible for intelligence services but if you 
look at any organogram that might be applicable from a certain year to now, you will always see that there is a, a minister. So in other words, what I'm looking at is whether uh, the interim constitution also gave the president the same choice uh, because this one does. And, and the only reason why there was no minister in there is no minister in that organogram for 94 to 97 responsible for intelligence is that the president at the time had elected not to assign a, a minister for intelligence whereas after that the various presidents assigned a minister uh, am i causing you any confusion no uh, it no. does uh, uh, the the question <coughs> uh, is obviously one that is reflected in the diagrams but not explained in yes. the diagrams and yes. uh, uh, I'm sure Mr. Sheikh can deal with yes. it now. <coughs> to, to the best of my recollection, the interim constitution did not express a view either which way on intelligence matters. I think it governed a whole range of other issues, but nothing turns on that simply because President Mandela, in appointing his cabinet in 1994, appointed the Minister of Justice to be the person responsible for dealing with administrative matters of things. So he was the Minister of Justice and remember, and that was 1994. The final constitution, again to the best of my memory, was adopted in 1996. So in 1996, the, 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 the final constitution made provisions for how this matter should be dealt with, but that came after. But in 1994, President Mandela did appoint Minister of Justice, then the late uh, Minister Dalla Omar, as the Minister of Intelligence, and a Deputy Minister of Intelligence. So he appointed a Deputy Minister, but I'm sure uh, the evidence leader is going to lead us to that matter of the coordinator of intelligence. Yes, no, that's fine. I think what was important for me is to just go back to the question which I had asked whether the, the interim constitution and the final constitution was the same on this issue. And, um, and, and, um, and uh, I think you are saying to the best of your knowledge it may have been the same. Yes. Uh, uh, but we, we will we'll need to check just so that one is, sh is sure about it. It may be that in the end it's neither here nor there, but I think it's important to appreciate whatever differences they may, they may, have, they, they may have been over the years in relation to intelligence, particularly when there may be uh, suspicions and allegations of um, intelligence services being misused or abused. Yes, indeed, Chair. Uh, the only observation for the present uh, is that, as I understand the interim constitution, it dealt with these matters in very general terms, whereas the final constitution was far more specific in relation to powers and duties. I, I'll just the, ask that you ask your uh, members of the legal team who are assisting you if uh, they can get uh, me the relevant portion of the interim constitution uh, during the lunch break. And we could print it and put it up to you. Yeah, we could. Uh, yes, yeah. that's being done. Yes, okay. Thank you, Chair. Can we go back then to the first organogram dealing with the period 1994 to 1997? And would you just deal, please, with the <coughs> reporting lines to the President through the National Intelligence Coordinating Committee on the one hand and the oversight duties of Parliament, the Inspector General of Intelligence and the Intelligence Oversight Committee on the left hand side of that diagram please. So two issues reporting through yeah. the, to the President and parliamentary oversight. So in 1994, once the, the various pieces of legislation was passed, the president appointed 
um, a coordinate of intelligence and that coordinate of intelligence was uh, at the time sitting member of parliament Joan Klantler and so he was appointed as the coordinate of intelligence and he was also assumed the function of the deputy minister of intelligence and uh, uh, coordinate in Klantler uh, reported directly to the president as envisaged by the legislation and coordinated the work of the intelligence services which is the sections we've been through in the block so he had direct access he was not a member of the cabinet uh, but the cabinet consisted of a cabinet security committee uh, in which president mandela chaired uh, no which uh, deputy president declared chaired uh, and President Mandela was in attendance together with Deputy President Mbeki. And it was the function of Joan Klantler and his team to make presentations to the cabinet on matters of intelligence and have direct access to the president in respect of other matters of intelligence. That's the first part. And then oversight. Please. The oversight is again because we were in that incredibly honeymoon period um, all the different uh, parties work together and the uh, the intelligence joint standing committee on intelligence oversight was formed it was a multi-party uh, body they were resourced to have their own offices protection was put in for them to have uh, uh, safe document keeping etc but that is a multi-party committee and it functioned very well over the intelligence services. And then the process began for the appointment of the Inspector General. And if my memory serves me well, I think the first Inspector General was Dr. Randera. Uh, he was appointed as the Inspector General. Was Dr. Uh, Randera, Faisal Randera. Oh, okay. If my memory serves me yes, well. Yes, there was uh, also the then Advocate I yes, Advocate yes. Uh, Skewe, I think, was the first. Yes. Right? Advocate Skewe was the first, and then uh, Dr. Randera. Uh, the Office of the Inspector General had considerable power, so to speak. Uh, the power of subpoena, the power of uh, getting whatever document from the intelligence services. And the intelligence services at that time was imbued with the spirit of uh, democratic accountability. So there was a much more forthcoming engagement with the Office of the Inspector General uh, than I would say it is now, but uh, that will be my comment. Then if we can go to RS40, or not RS40, but page 40 of exhibit PP4, we have an intelligence organogram for the period 1997 to 2009. What changed and how was that change brought about? So, so you recall that I said that the a sitting member of parliament, uh, late John Plantler was appointed as the coordinator. This gave um, incredible anxiety to the then Democratic Party, uh, who then, also in the spirit of reconciliation and cooperative governance, raised the issue with President Mandela's office that you couldn't have a sitting member of parliament con being considered as the coordinator of intelligence. Uh, which was envisaged to be a, a uh, non-political party position in keeping with the, the sections that we read earlier. In addition, Parliament had oversight function. Yes, in addition, Parliament had an oversight function. Right? So, you had, so there was this conflict uh, that was there. It was then decided that the law be amended. So the law was amended, having just passed it in 94, it was then amended. And what then emerged was the, the diagram that you see before you here. Uh, 
with the, the powers of the coordinator in the main were then housed under the ministers uh, of intelligence services and a minister of intelligence service was established. Uh, the National Intelligence Co uh, Committee became now uh, under the supervision of a minister. And this is the beginning of the Ministry of Intelligence and uh, the development of uh, a Minister of Intelligence as opposed to the reporting lines directly to the President. The oversight functions of Parliament remain. The oversight functions of Parliament remain, except if my, again, my memory served me correct, that the Minister or the, in, the, the Inspector General's office became dependent on or reported directly now to the Minister and increasingly became dependent on the Minister budget-wise, staffing-wise, etc. So that was the other significant change. I'm sorry, the Intelligence Oversight Committee mentioned there remained the same. Was that the parliamentary? That's the parliamentary, oh, yes. Because yeah. I've just written here parliamentary to make sure it's clear that yeah, yeah. It's, a it's, it's a committee of parliament. It's a committee of parliament. Yes. That's correct. And, and then the National Intelligence Coordinating Committee wasn't a parliamentary committee. It was not a, yeah, so, a bureaucratic. So I think that's why, because they are on more on the same level <laughs> what yes. I see here but there is a, there are certainly different colors correct and um, um, intelligence oversight committee reports to parliament and the inspector general reports to parliament so but I've just put in parliamentary intelligence oversight committee for my own purposes just to understand that that's a, a committee of parliament okay. Yes. Okay. Mm. Okay. perhaps blue is the long wrong color for parliament <laughs> I will say nothing. <laughs> <laughs> um, at the bottom of the page, um, you have in red, just to be fair, Chair, a, a number of other bodies. It seems that there was some organizational change at the time. That is correct. You, would you, you just please briefly describe the various entities that had developed administratively or organizationally at that time? Maybe before you do that, Mr. Sheikh, under this organogram, or maybe as would be the case subsequently, um, effectively, the various units under secret services that we looked at when we we're looking at the first organogram those all of those units effectively now are represented under those red um, boxes at the bottom of this one they, they uh, all reporting to the minister yes okay okay so that is correct so what happened was uh, the process of establishing the National Intelligence Agency as a standalone organization, the Secret Service as a standalone organization, and then certain functions that were previously in the NIA were now created as standalone uh, entities. And those entities are indeed the National Academy of Training, so it was called a, a, a Training Academy that trained both members of the, the National Intelligence Agency and members of the South African Secret Service and offered training to other departments if so requested. The National Communication Center is the is a center that has the technological capacity to engage in technological intelligence interception uh, and that's called the NCC. The Electronic Communication or COMSEC was a, a entity created to deal with internal communications of government so that government could communicate to each other in a more secure secure way than uh, it currently or it was doing at the time. And lastly, the office of the Interception Center was a, again, a, a 
authority created whereby the police and the military and uh, the civilian intelligence could address its request for particular inter interception. And again, it had to follow a particular protocol. The Office of the Interception would have to get judicial approval for this. Uh, the judge will stipulate the period for how long and under what conditions, etc. And it was the office, the IOC, uh, obligation to ensure that the regulations or the stipulations were indeed adhered to. And then on page 41 of Exhibit PP4, you have yet another series of structures and reporting lines. Again, please, if you would explain to the Chair what changed and how was that change brought about. And you may mention particularly your thoughts about a proclamation being used. Yes. So under the, the intelligence organigram entitled 2010 to 20, uh, 2019, um, there was now a, a reversal, so to speak. Right? And the reversal was uh, the proclamation created a, a new entity called the SSA, the South African uh, the state, uh, state security. Secu I can't even get the name. <laughs> state Security Agency, and the NIA was converted into the domestic branch of the SSA, and the, the South African Secret Service was converted into the foreign branch of the SSA, and all of this was done by proclamation under the auspices of a Director General. And, and all of this would have been under the auspices of the Director General. Uh, I was made, uh, Mr. Gibson uh, in Janja was made the head of the uh, domestic branch. I was made the head of the foreign branch. Uh, and because it was an interim period, we assumed our functions as Director Generals of those previous services. And it was considered this to be an interim period as the new paradigm uh, was evolving. I say that it was made by proclamation uh, and it did create some anxiety for us uh, and in particular for me because I was not too sure whether a proclamation is in keeping with the words that the president for any intelligence service other than the Intelligence Division of the Defense or Police Service, may be established only by the President. Yes, the President did establish by proclamation as the head of the National Executive. Yes, he did so in his capacity as head of the National Executive, and only in terms of national legislation. I was not, I was not of the view that proclamation represents national legislation. Can we go back to the provision of the Constitution that makes the point that only in terms of national legislation, uh, what was that section? It's section 209-1. 209-1. I think the ordinary understanding is that uh, national legislation means legislation passed by parliament. Exactly. And um, if that understanding is correct, then 
the establishment of any such service in a, by way of anything other than national legislation passed by parliament, then um, unless there is something that you and I don't know, uh, then it, it would appear that it might not have been in line with this. Okay, yeah. all right. And, and that precisely was our concern. And yes. I must say it's the concern of Ambassador Matretuka. Yes. Concern of Director General uh, Gibson and myself. Yes. Because we had the experience and the knowledge uh, of the way what was intended yes. by the Constitution, what mm. was intended in the legislation. Mm. And when we saw it in proclamation, mm. we were a little confused on Mm. Is this usurping the the, uh, the authority of Parliament? Mm. Because remember, earlier on, which it says that national security must be subject to the authority of the executive and Parliament, mm. Mm. and this mm. was a structure of a national security being born mm. through proclamation, where Parliament mm. has n had not yet the benefit mm. of debating mm. the proclamation or mm. the national legislation. Mm. And of course, there, there would have been a particular rationale behind that kind of provision to say only by way of national legislation. There is an emphasis. You can't do it in any other way. It must only be the president, and it can only be, even if it's him, but it can only be in that terms of correct. national legislation. And, and the that intent is, was very clear. It, 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 in other words, maybe the rationale might have been, and you can talk more about it uh, at some stage if it's necessary, but the idea must have been that if it's legislation, if it's established in terms of national legislation that's been passed by Parliament, then it will be acceptable to Parliament, which is the representatives of the people of South Africa, it will be acceptable to them, but also then the issue of oversight, I guess, comes in. Okay. Thank you. That's correct. <coughs> and as you've pointed out, Chair, fundamental to this issue, which we will research uh, just to see that we haven't missed something along the way, um, is the constitutional role of Parliament uh, and its fulfillment of that role and yes. perhaps even the usurping of that role, but that's mm. subject to our research. Yeah, okay. Um, Mr. Sheikh, if you look at this diagram uh, dealing with the period 2010 to 2019, it doesn't reflect uh, the military situation, but I presume that's the same. It goes through the Minister of Defence. Yes. With the intelligence function. Correct. Um, what is important to perhaps to emphasize is the ongoing accountability of crime intelligence under the auspices of the South African Police Services, still subject to the oversight of the Inspector General of Intelligence and indeed Parliament. Correct. And then if one goes to the National Intelligence Coordinating Committee and the Intelligence Coordinator, that remains the same, but now reporting to the Minister yes. of State Security as he is now named or she is now named. Correct. But what you've emphasized is that a single organizational entity, the State Security Agency, was formed um, with its two branches, domestic and foreign. That's correct. If I, if I may just add one more point to that, that in the manner in which all this has been arrived at. The principle, and which I'm very passionate about, the principle of coordination, in my view, has uh, been undermined. Um, so now we've gone back to a situation where each intelligence agency, I mean, each intelligence service, whether it's the security, the civilian intelligence service, or the police, or the military, because they've been, they've been uh, uh, bad coverage about all of them. You can see that you are starting to see the breakdown 
of the coordination which is what the constitution intended so in in a period of from from the time these changes were made you effectively have no coordination and that can't really be good because there should well, be a sharing of information and correct and uh, so on yeah and it does not allow any particular intelligence agency or part of an intelligence agency to go off on a frolic of its own as it were correct in the absence of coordination you would have frolics of your own uh, you would have in the intelligence world uh, everyone recruiting the same source uh, and in my opinion has given rise to the uh, entrenchment of a phenomenon not unique to South Africa uh, the phenomenon of uh, disinformation information peddlers and bogus uh, informants uh, which is a phenomenon that features regularly in South Africa's uh, lexicon yes, and language. You, you, you will touch on that later, later in your yes. evidence but the two important principles I understand you've emphasized are one coordination and two oversight and control correct Chair, it's uh, one o'clock. Uh, is it convenient to take the long adjournment? Yes, let's take the lunch adjournment. We'll resume at two o'clock. Thank you. Chair. We are adjourned. All rise.